is because they are uh, the ones who are doing the very good job. Uh, we always want uh, to compare ourselves with someone. For example, Riga wants to compare with Paris, that we are a small Paris. Innovation and inclusive uh, mobility. Uh, we are going to look at two um, projects from New York. To report, uh, nevertheless, you are back in Europe, but we will speak about uh, uh, New York's uh, experience where you've been uh, implementer, innovator, everything, the, the project manager most probably. Uh, so it is uh, uh, something very specific that you developed in New York City, which is always busy, never sleeps. And so, nevertheless, you made mobility inclusive and innovation is always there. So how it works. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me yes, well. Yes, we do. Uh, uh, perfect. Uh, so I was supposed now to be in New York City, but uh, I am in France. I will go there uh, within two weeks because now it's, uh, uh, let's say, it's uh, Thanksgiving in, in New York. All so. right. Yeah, you don't like turkeys. Uh, nevertheless, we want to <laughs> we want to speak about this mobility, the miracle you developed. So how can we copy paste it into Riga Street? Let me try to share my screen. Yeah, we see it. Yes. Perfect. So I'll go quite quickly because uh, I have seen many discussions about uh, the accessibility issues in general. So I will just um, give some, let's say, uh, some some global information quickly because I'm sure you are all aware about that. Um, we know all that there is more 1.3 billion people in the world who have to face a disability. Uh, what I like in, in this chart is just saying that we could build a continent uh, with uh, uh, deaf people, for example, because there is more uh, deaf people in the world than inhabitants in the European Union, or we build a full country uh, like France uh, only with wheelchair people. And I think we would build those cities, those continents completely different, differently if we only add those kind of people. So let's build uh, cities that include all those needs. And this is my point of view. And when we talk about accessibility, usually uh, I like to say that uh, the question is how to give access uh, to the services provided by our cities, now our smart cities. So the, the, the topic, yes, is how to, to provide those services. Um, and I work in the accessibility field for more than 12, 13 years. Uh, and what I've seen is that the first step of accessibility usually is a physical step. You build, you create a built environment with no barriers. Um, but once you've done that, very often the end users are not completely uh, autonomous uh, in those buildings. So if the goal is to give a real autonomy, uh, it's a first step, but it's not enough. Uh, let me give you, a, uh, let's say, um, uh, a metaphor about this. Uh, if you start an accessibility project uh, in a new city, uh, you are like in a desert. So you need to check to build roads, safe roads for the people to be able to move. Uh, if you don't have a ramp to access to a building with uh, 10, uh, 10 steps, uh, if there's no question, you can't enter this building. So the first step is to build those roads. Um, but the question then is how uh, to give information, how to give uh, an accessibility, how to give a, a GPS to those drivers, because many users know how to go to a, an existing destination where they go every day, but when they want to reach a new destination, it's quite a challenge to have access to those, those information. Can I go to this place if I'm, if I'm uh, in a wheelchair? Uh, if I'm blind, how can I get this new uh, bar where my friends are waiting for me? So what we know today is about 84, 85% of the population of Western countries uh, use a smartphone. Um, so it's a real key to accessibility. And just to finish on this general introduction before talking about New York, uh, our vision of accessibility is a mix between physical infrastructures. Uh, it's what I was talking about. Personal devices, of course, uh, including the smartphone. And today we have the data that can um, 
allow us to send information in real time to end users according to their needs. And of course, in the middle of this, uh, we don't forget human assistance, human training. It's a cultural question, mostly accessibility. So now let's talk about New York, what we've done there, um, because as you probably know, the city always tries to find the latest technology, the latest uh, solutions, and uh, the city is very involved in the accessibility field, uh, even though it's quite a challenge to, uh, to bring uh, more accessibility from scratch in this complex environment. So let me share quickly two projects. Uh, and if you have my metaphor in mind, I will start by talking about the GPS. Uh, in New York City today, uh, they have quite a challenge for the Metro uh, MTA because only 25% of the stations of the 80, uh, 430 stations uh, are what we call ADA compliant. So about 25% are fully compliant with the local standards and law. So the Transit Tech Lab, which gather different authorities, uh, launched a call for innovation in 2019 to make, uh, to bring more accessibility uh, for the, the New York riders uh, in terms of disabilities. Um, and so we, we won this call for innovation. And today we have a pilot installation and uh, uh, I had two people last week and I will go there uh, within two weeks. Uh, so what is the solution? So as I said, um, we do believe that personal assistant that fits the needs of any kind of user uh, will be an obvious tool within the next years. And that's why we developed uh, this solution. So let me show you quickly here. It's for a blind user. So, so this blind lady has a earbuds, earphone just one on the right. And she's never been to this station. So it's a very short video to, to make it concrete. So it means for blind users, they will just have to follow this voice. And it's like a car GPS. Uh, it's not thinking and walking uh, for you. You still have the control of the situation. You still have your white can, your guide dog if you are, if you are blind. Uh, but you have more information and it gives you possibility to navigate in uh, complex and unknown environments. Uh, just quickly how it works, because it's usually the question everybody asks. Uh, first, for the indoor positioning system, it means we install some beacons inside. We do triangulation, like for satellites, so we know where the smartphone is. Uh, then we have a back office for the customers, uh, like uh, metro companies, um, let's say, uh, museums, uh, airports, they can manage for their building, they can close a part when they are doing building work, they can add points of interest, they can say we have tactile on the floor and we will implement it uh, in the apps. And the third part of the technology is uh, uh, iOS and Android apps for end users. And what is interesting about this technology is that um, we made a lot of cognitive research with labs, uh, with end users, uh, because we started this project uh, maybe seven years ago, we made very big mistakes. We worked with end users. And today, uh, what we are doing in, in New York is very interesting and in different uh, buildings. So it's a turn by turn navigation. It gives you information as you've seen, just turn by turn. Um, cognition is not very good when you use a GPS map. Uh, maybe 40% of the population is not. Um, uh, let's say, don't use those maps very easily. So we use voice to give information and we have what we've learned in the past. It's obviously for uh, blind people, visually impaired people, but also wheelchair people. They want to have their hand free. They want just to have a small information on their uh, here. So it's uh, compliant on this part. Uh, and it, it must work also in the pocket for blind people or for wheelchair people. Uh, so we have dedicated user interfaces and user experience. So it means the interface of the app is different according to the profile of the user and the routes will be adapted. As I said, in New York, one of the issue is 25% of the stations accessible. And if the elevator is off, uh, it's a real challenge for wheelchair people. So uh, what we are trying now uh, to do with uh, New York and other metro we get the data from the elevators in real time, 
So if one elevator is off, we can recalculate directly the way for the end user in wheelchairs. So those kind of solutions that come to in, in different countries now I, uh, are mostly relevant for complex environments uh, and places where you don't go every day, uh, like railway stations, metro stations, universities, campus. Uh, we can cover a full campus with such solution. Uh, and because when you are a tourist, I've been uh, in different countries, sometimes the signage is very complicated. So uh, it's good to have information in your own language. Uh, public or private buildings, museums, etc. Uh, this is some examples of uh, venues that are equipped. And yes, this is the first solution. So to summarize quickly, uh, what are coming in the market, uh, it's those kind of personal assistance solutions. And uh, this is what we are implementing with uh, MTA in New York City. The second uh, project I wanted to talk about quickly uh, is called, uh, has been promoted by the Department of Transportation of New York City once again. And the goal for them was to enhance the mobility of the blind and low vision community, and especially to innovate uh, to cross the streets safely. Uh, so they launched this call for innovation. Uh, and we are talking now about what we call audible or accessible pedestrian signals. Um, what you can find almost everywhere in the world is push buttons. You have different shapes, different design, but almost everywhere it's push buttons. So when you ask blind people to reach a push button, it's not very easy. So they add a, a little beep that we call locator tone to find it. But it creates noise pollution, actually. It's a, a problem of design, I would say. Uh, you, you ask a blind people to touch a button on a pole in the street. Uh, so for um, hygienic questions, and of course, with the COVID that came uh, last year, uh, the people doesn't want now to, to still touch those kind of buttons. It's a, quite an issue. Uh, and these buttons are not connected uh, with any kind of data. So we answered this call for innovation with uh, 25 years of experience in those uh, solutions because we implemented about 250,000 units only, uh, only in France, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a remote activation APS, Accessible Pedestrian Signal. So this system can be triggered by a smartphone app that is free for the end, end users. So it means when they come close to an intersection, they will have a push information and then they can trigger the system they can choose a language. Um, and on the same ID, uh, we install audio beacons in front of buildings uh, in metro stations to make the signage. Once again, I talked to my first uh, first slides. Here we are talking about voice signage for visually impaired people. And only in Lyon, in my city, we implemented maybe 10,000 traffic lights and uh, maybe uh, 1,500 audio beacons at the entrance of metro station, building, public building, private building. My, my last slide is about what I think is the future of mobility for people with disabilities. Uh, it's what we call uh, the door-to-door -door, uh, for a full mobility assistant that will help the, the end users through open data, through a good user experience, uh, UX, UE, an app that will help them to go from their home to any destination through any transportation authority that works outdoor and indoor, that is connected with uh, our voice signage with different kind of technologies to help them to be fully autonomous in our complex and smart cities. And I would say smart cities is good, but it's not an objective, it's a mean. Smart cities and inclusive smart cities are our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it is very, very interesting, really. Those two things, of course, uh, we are uh, understanding that, uh, first of all, you can develop them in Lyon or in New York uh, because of the size of these uh, particular uh, cities, even can't say towns. Huh? But in the same time, you are a European Union citizen, and you know how much we want to 
in the field of green uh, bio, in the field of uh, mm, food safety, um, carbon neutrality. We want to show a nice showcase to the world. So now you implemented your develop, you developed it in Lyon and in New York. Could you please explain which logic works better, a European regulation that things that works already in Lyon should be implemented in the whole European Union because we really care about this, or because of the business that you can, I'm sorry to say, but I suspect yeah. that New York has a particular interest. So if you manage these things you showed, uh, you actually do a traffic more accessible, you, you decrease the number of private cars, you still push people to go with a public car. So you make uh, the life of the busy New York uh, metropolitan area more easy from the point of view of access to everyone, not only to people with disabilities. So the business model or this kind of regulation model, which one uh, should guide us closer to the stars, to this objective? <laughs> <laughs> I would say both of us. Okay. Um, well, uh, what I've seen in different countries, because we worked in the Middle East, in Russia, in, uh, in the US, in Canada, uh, actually, <clears throat> what I see is that the first step is to have a regulation and some obligation to make the built environment accessible. And this is the first step. Those kind of solutions come above its uh, use case, uh, usage, let's say, uh, solutions that come after. If you don't have a first step with build environment, I can guide a guy uh, in a wheelchair. If there is no ramp, he will not be able. Uh, he will will not be able to enter any building to go in any uh, metro station. So I, I would say uh, we need regulation, and it's a, a, a real driver to make countries to go forward. Uh, and then the business case is quite important. Why? I think uh, most of the time accessibility is seen as a, a cost, but we we try to explain that it's an investment. Uh, and as you mentioned, MTA in New York, the Metro of New York spent $400 million wow. for substitution transports. Um, so it's a huge cost, and as you said, it's individual transportation, so it, it creates pollution. So, of course, they have an interest in bringing back many users in public transportation uh, in terms of cost and in terms of uh, pollution. Yeah, that's a big challenge for a uh, whole civilization. So, well, but anyway, this technology is, I think, uh, so... Uh, vital uh, that uh, one day just expect the phone call from Latvia, okay? <laughs> there are many people who, who really are uh, happy with, with your presentation to know that when we build these smart cities, and we do, uh, we do in Latvia, uh, then you can upgrade them to the level you just showed us. We just need these sensors to, to the, attach to these uh, escalators, elevators, and all, all that stuff you, you, you just uh, showed. Uh, Sylvian, uh, I'm uh, happy to say uh, good luck to you and Merry Christmas. Thank you. You, you made uh, us more happy that there are solutions. Uh, nevertheless, it will be still interesting for you probably to follow.